I want you to hit me as hard as you can. A list of beloved and popular Christmas movies wouldn't be complete without Joe Dante's Gremlins. The horror comedy was a massive success when released in the summer of 1984, becoming a cinematic touchstone and pop culture mainstay for the next three and a half decades. The question is, if the movie was as disturbingly dark and viciously violent as originally scripted, would it have enjoyed the same success? Probably not. In fact, once super producer Steven Spielberg came on board to shepherd the film, numerous changes were made to the overall tone of the entire project. Not only was the script radically changed in favor of a more family-friendly affair, but the central character of Gizmo the Mogwai was also completely revised. Despite the movie's major success, Gremlins also suffered backlash from concerned parents who deemed the film too violent for children. With so many things to unpack about its production history, let's shed some light on what the f*** happened to this movie. Gremlins centers on Billy Peltzer, a high school kid who is given a mysterious Christmas gift from his inventor dad, Randall. At a curiosity shop in Chinatown, Randall obtains a cute but cryptic creature called a mogwai, which, as it turns out, translates to monster or demon in Cantonese. Randall is given three rules to ensure the mogwai's safety. One, keep it hidden from bright light. Two, never let it touch water. And three, don't feed it after midnight. Randall takes the cute creature home and gives it to Billy, whose teenage irresponsibility soon leads to a breach in two of the three rules. Upon getting wet and fed after midnight, the Mogwai multiplies and mutates into murderously maniacal miscreants that proceed to run roughshod over the quaint town of Kingston Falls right as Christmas approaches. Screenwriter Chris Columbus originally wrote Gremlins as a spec script to try and break into Hollywood. He had no real intention of it getting made, only to show that he could write quality screenplays. According to Columbus on the movie's DVD commentary, the inspiration for the story came from his time living in a loft in New York City's Garment District, which he claimed sounded like a platoon of mice would come out, and to hear them skittering around in the blackness was really creepy. Once Steven Spielberg read Columbus's script, he enthusiastically insisted on making it into a feature film, saying, It's one of the most original things I've come across in many years, which is why I bought it. With an estimated budget of $11 million, Spielberg set up the film at Warner Brothers through his relatively new production company, Amblin Entertainment. When it came time to find a director for Gremlins, Spielberg initially considered hiring Tim Burton, but since he'd only made short films at that point, Spielberg was worried about his ability to make a full-length picture. Because Spielberg reportedly loved Joe Dante's 1981 werewolf movie, The Howling, he tapped him to direct Gremlins, precisely because of Dante's deft touch with melding humor and horror in equal measure. Spielberg was also quite familiar with Dante, having worked with him on Twilight Zone the movie. Plus, Gremlins producer Michael Finnell had also produced The Howling, so Dante seemed like the most sensible fit for the project. From there, several script changes were made to tone down the hyper-violent terror. Among the more graphic scenes to be excised from the script included a scene in which Billy's mother, Lynn, gets into a violent scuffle with one of the Gremlins, who decapitates her and throws her severed head down a flight of stairs. While Burger King is prominently displayed in the final film, another cutscene would have shown the Gremlins voraciously occupy a McDonald's and eat all of the human customers instead of Big Macs and Quarter Pounders. One of the more memorable scenes in the film is when Billy's dog, Barney, real name Mushroom, the same dog that appeared in Pumpkinhead, gets strung up by the Gremlins outside the house using Christmas lights. Originally, Columbus's script had a scene in which the Gremlins eat Barney to death. All of these morbidly murderous scenes were wiped from the script in order to retain a more audience-accessible tone. However, the biggest change to the script came at the fundamental story level. Gizmo and Stripe were meant to be one and the same, with the adorable Mogwai morphing into the sinister gremlin leader as the film went on. It was Spielberg's idea to differentiate the two characters, and insisted that Stripe be the main antagonist, stressing that Gizmo was so cute that audiences would want to see him safely through to the end of the story. Dante told Variety the studio wanted to trim a lot of gremlin scenes, which they found revolting. Spielberg said, We can cut out the gremlins and call the picture People, but I don't think anyone is going to come. Obviously, Spielberg got his way. One scene in Columbus's original script that was left intact, despite its unthinkably dark nature, is the speech Kate Berenger gives about her father breaking his neck in a chimney while dressed as Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. Spielberg didn't like the scene and wanted to remove it from the final cut but ultimately allowed Dante to preserve his own artistic vision. Dante would later spoof the scene in Gremlins 2, The New Batch. 
When it came time to cast the film, Spielberg lobbied for the relatively unknown Zach Galligan to play Billy because of the natural chemistry he exhibited with co-star Phoebe Cates in the audition process. Judd Nelson and Emilio Estevez were both considered to play Billy before co-starring in The Breakfast Club together in 1985. According to Dante, Emilio Estevez was the closest to getting the part, but when Spielberg watched his tape, he yelled out, Look, he's internalizing! So he didn't get the part. Despite veteran actor Pat Hingle giving a tremendous audition for Randall Peltzer, the part was given to Hoyt Axton, who, in addition to being Dante's first choice, reportedly improvised nearly all his lines in the film. Dick Miller, who appeared in nearly all of Dante's films, was cast as Billy's xenophobic neighbor, Murray Futterman, who gets killed in the script but was changed in the finished movie to confirm his survival. Polly Holliday was chosen to play the crotchety Mrs. Deagle, the mean, money-obsessed harridan whose cats are named after international currencies. Phoebe Cates' Fast Times at Ridgemont High co-star, Judge Reinhold, was cast as Gerald Hopkins, an antagonist who disappears halfway through the film due to drastic story edits. A deleted scene shows that he spends much of his time going mad while hiding from the gremlins inside the bank vault. For Gizmo, Howie Mandel was hired to do the voice work after being suggested by veteran voice actor Frank Welker, who plays Stripe in the film. Corey Feldman, who had a similar part cut from Spielberg's E.T. two years earlier, was cast as Billy's buddy, Pete Fontaine. Francis Lee McCain was cast as Billy's mother, Lynn. The following year, McCain would go on to play Lorraine's mother, Stella, in Back to the Future, which was filmed on the same universal backlot as Gremlins. Yes, the Kensington Falls Square in Gremlins is redressed as Hill Valley Plaza from Back to the Future. Save the clock tower! Save the clock tower! The movie theater that the Gremlins overtake is the same cinema that Marty McFly crashes into at the end of Back to the Future. Crazy drunk driver. Gremlins began principal photography on April 27, 1983, and wrapped in July of the same year. The entire film was shot at Warner Brothers and Universal Studios, and, as you'd guess from springtime in California, required large amounts of fake snow to simulate winter. Dante expressed gratitude for Spielberg's preoccupation directing Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at the same time, leaving Dante to his vision without many creative notes. For the mischievous creatures of the title, the decision was made to forego stop-motion animation and use practical animatronic puppets. Another idea had been to use monkeys as performers inside gremlin costumes, which was nixed when a test monkey freaked out after its head was covered with a mask. Eventually, Chris Wallace was hired as the production designer and creator of the gremlin creatures. Wallace told Empire Magazine, After reading the script, my first idea was to take the tarsier, a little primate, and give it cartoony proportions. I wanted the big eyes to make it cute. I showed it to Mike Finnell and Joe Dante, and they asked for some tweaks, so I made the next one. This is more like a puppy, big floppy ears. These were the only two mogwai I sculpted before the final one. Wallace went through several painstaking efforts to appease Spielberg, claiming that Dante called up and said, Steven is wondering if you can match the color of his dog. So we had to look at photos and match the fur of his beagle. We were tearing our hair out the whole time on the movie. Actors often performed their scenes opposite the rubber animatronic puppets. About his time acting opposite Gizmo, Galligan states, It was beneficial having practical special effects because I was reacting to a thing in front of me, as opposed to stuff you're attempting to imagine, as you would with CGI. You can see the performance in the dog, Barney, which must be one of the top ten animal performances in movies. He was convinced the puppets were real. For Gizmo specifically, multiple puppets were created. Oftentimes, Billy would set Gizmo down in one shot, and another puppet would be used next time Gizmo appeared on screen. The puppets also had a tendency to break because of their small stature, causing much dismay for Wallace. According to Phoebe Cates, Chris Wallace was the head of animatronics and he was the designer. He was really a one-man show. He was always kind of crouched somewhere with that little control box in his hand. Wallace told Fangoria magazine that he suggested creating larger gizmo puppets to increase functionality, but Dante insisted on retaining the cuddly nature by keeping the puppets small. As a therapeutic response, Dante revealed that the production crew had fashioned a list of horrible things to do to Gizmo, which resulted in the scene where the gremlins hang Gizmo on a bullseye and throw darts at him. For the scenes involving Gizmo multiplying, the eggs that expand and hatch were made from small balloons covered in fur. Wallace also used a balloon effect for the infamous microwave scene, in which Lynn nukes a nasty gremlin to gory smithereens. Staying with the grisly kitchen scene, Wallace created a graphic effect of a gremlin attempting to pull a knife out of its body after Lynn stabs it off screen. The effect was deemed too gruesome and was cut, although you can partially see the effect over Lynn's shoulder as she microwaves the other gremlin. 
Similarly, the death of science teacher Mr. Hansen was originally far more ghastly. A scene was filmed in which Mr. Hansen is seen with multiple hypodermic needles stuck in his face after sustaining a gremlin attack. At the behest of Spielberg, the scene was reshot to feature a single needle in Mr. Hansen's buttocks as a, uh, cheeky replacement. But the biggest hurdle Chris Wallace had to overcome was the drastic change to make Gizmo and Stripe two separate entities. As mentioned before, the original idea was to have the character transform into the psychotic Stripe by the end. Billy would then kill Stripe, changing the Mogwai back to Gizmo so he could return him to the shop in Chinatown. When Spielberg ordered the change, Wallace had to think fast and find a resolution. This is why Gizmo has very little to do in the second half of the movie, and is mainly seen through a series of close-up reaction shots. As Stripe and his minions overtake the town, Dante was forced to make Gizmo a secondary character until the defeat of Stripe at the end. Speaking of the ending, it was also altered in the editing phase. The scene was originally filmed with two window blinds, one that Gizmo pulls and one that Billy pulls, which exposes Stripe to sunlight and kills him. In the final edit, only Gizmo is shown heroically defeating Stripe. Perhaps not surprisingly, this was also Spielberg's idea. Another instrumental part of Gremlin's success is the musical score, arranged by the legendary film composer Jerry Goldsmith, who went on to win a Saturn Award for Best Music. The movie also won for Best Horror Feature, Best Director, and Best Special Effects. Goldsmith also wrote the song Gizmo Sings in the film, but rather than using Howie Mandel, he recruited a young girl who had never acted in a movie before. Goldsmith makes a cameo appearance, along with Spielberg, during the scene in which Randall Peltzer calls home from his invention convention. Although originally slated for a Christmas time release, Gremlins premiered on June 8, 1984, opening the same day as Ghostbusters. Gremlins still came in a close second. On an estimated budget of $11 million, Gremlins became a surprise hit by grossing more than $148 million worldwide. The international success could be attributed to the various languages, songs, and references given to the Gremlins to speak in foreign language versions of the film. For example, according to Dante, for the German release of the film, the Gremlins sang traditional beer songs in the infamous bar scene. For Gizmo, Howie Mandel recorded his lines phonetically for foreign dubs and region-specific jokes added in post-production. Gremlins was re-released theatrically in 1985, adding another $64 million in global ticket sales for a grand worldwide box office total of $212 million before generating roughly $80 million more in video sales in 1985. Despite the massive commercial success, one of Gremlins' most lasting legacies is its role in creating the PG-13 rating. Along with the heart-tugging terror of Spielberg's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the movie was deemed too violent for a PG rating and too tame for an R rating. While both movies were ultimately tagged with PG certifications prior to release, the MPAA was forced to create a compromising middle ground shortly after. Thus was born the PG-13. Critically speaking, Siskel and Ebert gave Gremlins two thumbs up for its sly series of send-ups and its wickedly funny and slightly sick ride. The New York Times' Vincent Canby claimed the film is funniest when being most nasty. On the contrary, Leonard Maltin awarded the film two out of four stars, decrying its icky and gross nature, and saying that it was negated by too vivid violence and mayhem. Director Joe Dante himself prefers Gremlins 2, the new batch, to the original Gremlins, of which he once stated, I still have no idea why this picture was successful. As an inside joke, Dante cast Leonard Maltin in Gremlins 2, where he continued to criticize the original before being devoured by the murderous Mogwai. In addition to inspiring a slew of ancillary merchandise, from video games to toys to breakfast cereal, Gremlins is perhaps most influential for the subsequent string of diminutive creature features such as critters, ghoulies, troll, hobgoblins, munchies, and so on. Although a planned third Gremlins movie and a complete reboot have both been explored over the last decade, in 2019, Warner Media announced plans to create an animated HBO Max prequel series entitled Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai. Much like Billy Peltzer with his mysterious new pet, the production of Gremlins didn't really follow the rules either, but it overcame a number of challenges and ended up becoming one of the all time favorite Christmas horror movies ever made. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company and we appreciate your support.